I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're definitely going to learn something today. Betaflight 3.1 is almost here, and it's time for me to take you through all the new features and changes that Betaflight 3.1 brings to the table. Before we get into the video, I want to tell you that this is just one in a series of videos I'm going to make about Betaflight 3.1. So I'm going to make another video going over the changes to the configurator and additional videos dealing with uh, more sophisticated commands like resource remapping that you can't just give an overview and that's it. So check down in the video description. There's a link to the playlist where that'll have all the remaining videos and check them all out so you know everything you need to know about Betaflight 3.1. All right, the intro's done. Let's get into the overview. And we'll just work our way through the release note highlights. I'll read them off and I'll tell you what they all mean. Added F7 support with already a few supported targets. So uh, right now, many of the boards we're using are F3 processors. The F4 processor is a faster processor. And the next one after that is not F5 or F6, but F7. I don't know why that is. That's just the way it is. So in this case, Betaflight is future-proofing itself against future developments that'll use this next processor down the line. Right now, there's almost no boards out there that actually have an F7 processor. And if you look at even an F4 board, you can run uh, you know, 8 kilohertz uh, PID loop and you're at like 2% processor utilization. So we're really not even beginning to stress the F4 boards yet, but Betaflight is very future looking, forward looking, and F7 support is already being baked in. Dynamic I.O. pin allocation. This is, in my opinion, one of the most exciting features that Betaflight 3.1 brings to the table. It gives you the ability to arbitrarily, pretty much arbitrarily, remap resources to different pins and headers on the flight controller. So you know, if you've ever used a custom motor mix, you know you can remap motor outputs, but you're not really remapping the motor output. You're not moving motor number one to header number five. All you're doing is you're telling Clean Flight, motor number one's not on the front left, now it's on the front right but you haven't actually changed where uh, Betaflight thinks that motor number one is. Well, now you can. You can remap the motor's outputs to any motor header you want. And in fact, you can remap kind of anything to anything else. So if you think back to the, the CC3D guys used to have, if they wanted a buzzer, they had to have a buzzer on, I think it was motor header number six was used as a buzzer output. And they had to download a custom compiled hex file and flash this hex file with motor uh, with buzzer on motor six. Well, you, they don't have to do that anymore. You can just tell Betaflight that the buzzer is on motor header six and then, okay, no problem. Uh, this is great if you need to remap your motors. It's a much simpler way of remapping your motors. It's also great if you physically damage your board. If, so, if you lift the PPM input pin on your, uh, on your NAS32, that was it. You were done. There was no alternative. Well, in theory, now you could remap that PPM input to some other pin and you're good to go. It was a very, very exciting feature. D-Shot support. D-Shot support for F3 and F4 boards. Sorry, F1 boards. No D-Shot support for you. Uh, D-Shot, I have a whole video about everything you need to know about D-Shot, and I'll just link you to that in the upper right. Uh, it supports D-Shot speeds 150, 300, 600, and there's even a new D-Shot called D-Shot 1200, which is it's just a faster D-Shot, uh, and that would be a topic of another video. Betaflight 3.1 supports D-Shot now. Full floating point logic for flight behavior. Now, this is one of the reasons why F1 boards don't really work very well with Betaflight 3.1 anymore. Betaflight has done a fantastic job at extending the lifespan of the F1s, but we're finally coming to the point where F1s just can't keep up. And one of the changes that's been made is that the underlying flight logic, the PID calculation, the rate calculation, all that stuff is all done with floating point math. Now, the pros and cons, of, in terms of flight performance, there's nothing you can do with floats that you can't do with integers. You can do anything you want to with ints, uh, but it's just harder uh, from the programmer's perspective to deal with. There's a lot more overhead and complexity and room for errors. So it is great from a programmer's and a developer's perspective that we've got these floats here. But anybody you hear telling you that floats make a program more accurate, there's no reason why floats have to make a program more accurate. Uh, it, they just make it easier for the programmers to do things right. And now Betaflight 3.1 has floats. Uh, all the internal math is with floats. The reason this means that F1 boards are kind of out in the cold is that F1 boards don't have a floating point unit on board. So they are very, very slow at doing floating point math. Whereas F3, F4, and so on boards all have a dedicated floating point unit in the processor. They can do floating point math very quickly. 
many code optimizations, faster PID speeds possible on F3 and F4. Uh, what this means essentially is that with Betaflight 2.9, 3.0, and 3.01, you generally wanted your CPU utilization to be less than about, I would say, 30% at most. And the reason for that is that there would be spikes in the CPU utilization that would mean that even though your average was 30%, you would still get these spikes up to 100% that could cause problems for you in flight. With Betaflight 3.1, number one, under a given set of conditions, generally CPU utilization will be lower, but also many of these spikes have been worked out to keep the loop time more stable. And what that means is that according to Boris, you can run up to about 50% processor utilization without running into error, error, error issues where the copter like drops out of the air or has problems arming. Support for KISS ESC telemetry. If you have KISS ESCs, Betaflight can read the ESC telemetry from the KISS ESCs just like a KISS FC would do. So you can read that uh, RPM and current and voltage telemetry from the ESCs. A very cool feature if you're using KISS ESCs and also a great indicator of, of the Betaflight and the KISS teams working together in the spirit of brotherhood and friendship and flowers and hippies and all that good stuff. I, I do, I, I mean, I, I joke about it, but I actually am really happy to see people in this hobby working together and not being all partisan and, and closed off and enough said. Added serial ESC pass-through for KISS24 and Castle ESCs. All this means is that if you have KISS or Castle ESCs, you can flash them using pass-through just like you use to be able, just like you can do with BLHeli. Added crossfire support for TBS receivers and associated telemetry. So crossfire is, I think it's 900 megahertz uh, control link, uh, and it has telemetry just like Tyrannus does. Uh, and the idea is you put a crossfire receiver in your copter, you put a crossfire module in your radio, and now you have this really long range, really reliable link. Uh, anyway, Betaflight now supports crossfire receivers. Additional OSD parameters like PIDs and transmit power. So what this means is you can see the PIDs in real time while you're flying. Well, what good is that? The PIDs don't change while you're flying. Yes, they do if you have in-flight adjustments. So now when you do in-flight adjustments, instead of listening to just beep, 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 the copter beeps at you and you have no idea what your, gain, what your PIDs are, now you can change your PIDs in flight using in-flight adjustments and see on the OSD what the actual value is. This really makes in-flight adjustments so much more useful. Added Unify Smart Audio Support. This is, this. I take it back, this may be the coolest, because you know what, resource remapping, 90% of you are never gonna do it. But smart audio, this is cool. So this is a, a technology that I believe was developed by TBS, Team Black Sheep. It was developed for their um, PowerCube and their Unify uh, video transmitter. And what it does is it uses the audio input, the microphone input on the video transmitter to transmit serial data, like a modem, right? Like remember the modems back in the days, they transmitted data over phone lines, right? So what it means is that the flight controller can control the transmit power and the channel and other features of the video transmitter, such as pit mode, from within itself. So the most common way this is used is uh, if you have Betaflight OSD, within the Betaflight OSD, if smart audio is enabled, you'll be able to control the video transmitter from within the OSD. But there are other ways to do it. Uh, someone has developed a Lua script, which is a program that runs on the Tyrannus, and you can use your Tyrannus buttons to adjust your transmit power and your channel. Smart audio is essentially the serial link between the Betaflight flight controller and the video transmitter, and it uses the audio input on the video transmitter, which many people aren't using anyway, as a way of getting that data in there. Added MSP over smart port. So what this means is that if you have a smart port telemetry between your FreeSky receiver and the flight controller, you can do MSP protocol over that link. And it, many people don't know this, but smart port is not just sort of a dumb telemetry link. It's actually a bi-directional serial protocol. What this means is that you could run one of these Lua scripts, these programs that run on the Tyrannus, and from within the Tyrannus, you could do things like change PIDs, you could, you could do anything you could do via the CLI or the configurator in theory, and that data will be communicated over the RF link to the receiver, and the receiver will communicate those commands to the flight controller via the telemetry link. So basically, this is useful if you have a Tyrannus, because you can run these Lua scripts, and you could configure your whole copter from the Tyrannus, in theory, if someone wrote a Lua script that could do it. 
Fixed jumbo frame handling on VCP targets. Have you noticed that downloading black box logs from your flight controller takes for freaking ever? Well, it takes even longer for freaking ever on VCP targets, targets that use the virtual COM port. And the reason for this is that the way that Betaflight was talking to the virtual COM port was not the best. So basically, this means that if you have a VCP board, your download of your black box logs will be much faster. New anti-gravity threshold parameter. Now, this is a parameter that engages an anti-gravity generator to allow you to get more inverted hang time. Do you believe me? No. Anti-gravity threshold is designed to address the problem where the copter, uh, it, like you change the throttle position, you jam the throttle and the copter's nose pitches up, or you chop the throttle and the nose pitches down. The idea here is that when the throttle is changing position rapidly, the copter's aerodynamic situation is changing rapidly, and the eye term moves too slowly to keep up. Now, one, some people have said, well, why don't we just make the eye term move faster? And if you did that, the I term would basically just become the P term. We've already got a P term. It's doing its job. We need the I term to move slowly so that it can do the thing it needs to do. You need a slow and steady person to steer the ship. What the anti-gravity threshold does is it resets the I term when the throttle moves rapidly. The copter will become more resistant to pitching up and pitching down the nose or anything, yawing left or yawing right when you jam or chop the throttle. Protection against too fast motor speeds. Now this is going to surprise some of you. It's going to catch some of you. Uh, one shot 125, it can run up to four kilohertz technically, but realistically speaking, it's not good to run it over about two kilohertz. Well, Betaflight will now enforce that. So many people have run into problems where they've got their PID loop set at 4K and they're running one shot and then they wonder why their motors are dropping out of the sky, right? When you set one shot as your motor protocol, the configurator will prevent you from using faster than a two kilohertz PID loop. And that's going to surprise some of you are out there are going to be going, I'm setting my PID loop to, two, to 4K and I keep hitting save and it keeps going back to 2K. Eh, this thing is broken. It's because you have one shot selected. When you select multi-shot or D-shot, you can select the higher PID loop values. There have been some changes to how the auto level modes work. And uh, when I saw this, I was like, wow, uh, we're working on auto level in beta flight. Okay, whatever. The two new parameters are level sensitivity and level limit. Level sensitivity is the maximum angle that the copter will, will angle to at full stick deflection when in angle mode. So if you set level sensitivity to, uh, to, to 45 at full stick deflection, the copter will pitch over to 45 degrees. Level limit is the maximum allowed angle. There's a little bit un, uh, confusing how they've set this up. Uh, basically, level limit is always going to be less than level sensitivity. So you can say level sensitivity 80 degrees, level limit 45 degrees. And what happens is that at full stick deflection, the copter would be at 80 degrees, but halfway through the travel, it'll just stop at 45 degrees. I'm not sure why you wouldn't then just set level sensitivity to, to 45 degrees though. So I'm not actually, I don't fly auto level and it's, I'm not really grasping why we've got these two separate parameters when we could just have one, but presumably there's a good reason and I don't fly auto level anyway, so I don't really care. Added Emergent RC Tramp VTX support. So uh, you, you know the Tramp is that new uh, video transmitter from Immersion RC and it's got the NFC wand that you can use to change the, uh, to change the transmit power in the channel. Well, now you can change the transmit power in the channel from within the Betaflight OSD or presumably a Lua script on your Tyrannus if that exists, which it probably doesn't. You'll connect a UART on the flight controller to the telemetry input on the Tramp. Uh, transmitter and then you're good to go. You can control it. Okay, there is your overview of the features of Betaflight 3.1. I'm making a little bit of a risky move by releasing this video when we're only on RC10. There may be a few new things added or changed, but I feel like we're close enough that it's worth putting this video out. I know a lot of you guys are really waiting to see it. Betaflight just continues to impress and excite me with all the new features it's adding. I can't wait to see what comes next. Uh, but that's going to be all for now. I hope this has been educational, and as always, happy flying.